Good morning, church. It's good to see you and good to be with you again. Why don't you try this uh, exercise sometime? Um, open to the contents page of your Bible and then go through each book of the Bible and see if you can maybe name three to five facts about each book of the Bible. Maybe who the author was, maybe there's some verses you recall or particular characters or storylines. It's a great thing to maybe try in your Bible study as well. And if you can't say three to five things, then, then maybe just mark that book of the Bible as unknown. Now, this is something that I've done uh, a number of times over the years with various Bible studies, even when I was a part-time lecturer at Baptist College, did it with students. And in one particular young adults group, I remember us adding up the number of years that we'd all known Christ, and it came to a combined total of 150 years. And then we went through, and just kind of three to five facts is kind of just very like basic. And as we went through, we discovered that we only knew what 13 of the 66 books of the Bible were about. That means the, the group I was leading uh, didn't know what 80% of the Word of God is about. And yet all of us in that group claimed that all Scripture is God-breathed. And you've been part of this church that has that same legacy. And, and, and I, I hope most of you would claim this morning the same thing, that all Scripture is God-breathed. So then the challenge for us is, why are there some parts of Scripture that we never read and we seldom study? I think about the seriousness with which many Muslim children will memorize the Quran. And around the world every year, Muslim children will memorize the Quran in Arabic. Even though many of them cannot understand Arabic, they'll learn it off pat, listening to the sounds, and, and what an incredible feat that is. So shouldn't it sober us as Christians that there are parts of our Bibles that we don't even know? And that's why I want us to begin a, a new sermon series that I've called God's Forgotten Postcards. And we want to look at the shortest, most forgotten books of the Bible. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will do two things. That he will give you an excitement to dust off other books of the Bible that maybe you've forgotten, maybe you, you haven't read in a long time, or maybe you have to say, I don't know what, what that's about at all, that, that, that this morning would whet your appetite and, and the weeks ahead would do that to say, hey, this is a springboard for me to go and uh, do some work now. And Holy Spirit, won't you stir in, in me a desire to do that? Um, and, and in this series, we, we can't really dive in deep. We just kind of kind of do an overview of all of these books. So that's the first thing. And then secondly, that God's voice would just be unleashed in all of scripture. Because in essence, if we're ignoring parts of God's word, we are silencing God's voice in certain parts of his word. So as we start, I want to give you some cryptic clues to help you guess what book of the Bible we're going to study today. If you've been around the last few weeks of announcements, maybe you already know. But here's some cryptic clues. The following four movies all have a connection with this book of the Bible. Indiana Jones, The Mummy Returns, Transformers and Mortal Kombat. It's the shortest book in the Old Testament. It's one chapter long, just 21 verses, only about 600 words. I've never heard a sermon from this book. I've never even heard anyone quote any part of this book ever in my limited history. Which book is it? Megatron. Megatron. All right. <laughs> okay, we, we're further back than I thought we were. Way further back. <laughs> it's the book of Obadiah. <laughs> it's the book of Obadiah, and it's one of God's forgotten postcards to us. So I want you to join me as we pray. Lord, we ask that you'd open our eyes to see beautiful things in your word. We ask you to forgive us for neglecting your word, that, Lord, there might be things that you would teach us and challenge us, that we would be spurred on to read all of Scripture, to know the whole counsel of God for our lives. And so, Lord, won't you come and open our eyes? Won't you enable us to obey? Lord, uh, some of these books will be difficult to understand. There might be concepts. There might be background that makes it difficult for us as we sit here 2019 in South Africa to fully grasp. And so I just pray that you, by your Spirit, would move in us, open our hearts, and, Lord, cause us to love you more and to be different and to love our neighbor as ourself as a result. We ask that you do this in our midst, even this morning, as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn with me to the book of Obadiah. It's in the Old Testament. I have to give you the page number because you could just keep flicking around there and not find it. It's on page 830, 830 in the Old Testament, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. So hopefully if you're paging, you can kind of just stop there. Page 830. 
and have it open. As I said, it's more an overview this morning. There are things I could have camped on. I even thought of, hey, should I do this over two weeks? But I've disciplined myself to stick to, to one week. So let's start by asking a couple of questions of the text. Have it open, particularly uh, verse 1. The first question I want us to ask is, who was Obadiah? Who was Obadiah? It's a good place to start because that's where verse 1 starts. It says, the vision of Obadiah. Now we know almost nothing about who Obadiah was. He's pretty much unknown. In fact, Obadiah was such a common name that we read of around a dozen different Obadiahs in the Old Testament, none of whom seem to match up with this Obadiah. The name Obadiah in the Hebrew simply means servant of God. And that's what he's going to be. He's just going to be a servant of God. He's going to be a herald. He's, he's just going to bring us a message. And the interesting thing is that Obadiah, unlike other prophets in the Old Testament, if you think of Jeremiah or, or, or uh, Isaiah uh, and other sort of well-known prophets, Obadiah tells us nothing about his family in the opening lines. He doesn't give us his father's name. He doesn't say where he's from, he, his hometown. He doesn't say which kings were reigning at the time. And so you get the sense that the focus is not meant to be on Obadiah, but on the message that he's bringing. And so isn't it ironic then that not only have we forgotten Obadiah the prophet, but we've forgotten the message that he wants to bring as God's herald. So that's who Obadiah was. Maybe not so helpful, but in another sense helps to focus us. Question number two, who was Edom? Yeah, and Edom wasn't a, a kind of cheese. It's a slightly different. Look at verse one. The vision of Obadiah, <clears throat> this is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. So Obadiah's prophecy is a message of judgment against a nation called Edom. And this is where it gets interesting. Edom means red, and Edom is another name for Esau. Remember Esau back in the book of Genesis? The color red described Esau's hair. <coughs> it, it described his skin. It described the red stew for which he was willing to sell his uh, birthright to his brother Jacob. And so Esau was the twin brother of Jacob. The descendants of Esau were called Edomites. And guess where they lived? In Edom. And the descendants of Jacob, his twin brother, were known as Israelites. And at this time in history, they lived in what is known as Judah. So I won't get into the details of what happened in the history that, that they're not technically in Israel, they're in what's called Judah. But take a look at this map and you'll see just <clears throat> where Edom was located largely on the eastern side uh, of the Dead Sea across the Araba Valley. You can see that white sort of shape there. That's where the Edomites lived. And their twin brother and his descendants, their next door neighbors, lived there in Judah. So it'll give you something of an idea. That little sea on the, on the left is the Mediterranean, if that helps you get your bearings. And there was conflict between these two brothers from before they were even born. While they were still in the womb, they were jostling. This is what the book of Genesis tells us. The babies jostled with each other within her. And Rebekah said, why is this happening to me? And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. It's interesting as a complete aside, which I wasn't going to tell you about, but there's some research that's been done by a, 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 a professor in Cape Town, actually at UCT, uh, who's a Hebrew scholar as well. And she believes that the condition of Jacob and Esau was actually twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. And you can Google that. It's basically where they have to share the placenta. And so one baby gets all the blood and the other one hardly gets anything. It means one comes out red in color and strong. It's just a very interesting theory that they were actually identical twins. But anyway, these two nations continue to bicker throughout history. And uh, isn't that interesting that often family hatred and racism and prejudice can be passed on from generation to generation? Just one of those accounts, because there's so many we could highlight. But when the Israelites were released from captivity in Egypt, Pharaoh said that uh, they could go. 
So the, 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 the nation of, of God needed to pass through Edomite territory. And one would think that their brothers would have welcomed them through, but that's not what, what happened. The, the, the Edomite brothers said, you're not going to pass this way. And we read about that in Numbers 20. So there was this ongoing hostility. And even so, God commanded his people in Deuteronomy 23 verse 7, do not detest an Edomite, for he is your brother. He's your brother. It's interesting we come to this book of the Bible in this season uh, with all that's been happening in our, in our country when we think about fellow Africans, our brothers and sisters, and, and God says, do not detest the Edomite, for he is your brother. And so by the time we reach the book of Abadiah, the hostility is reached an all-time high. Um, there's all sorts of things that, are, that have gone on, and it's this ongoing family hatred that really is the background to the prophecy of, our, of Obadiah. So who was Obadiah? We've answered that. Who was Edom? And then thirdly, what is the book of Obadiah about? Well, in 587 BC, this world power called the Babylonians came into Judah and basically destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple, this magnificent temple that Solomon had built 400 years earlier. Just imagine if you were a, a Jewish believer, the center of worship, the, the place of God's presence, the, this magnificence, and it's absolutely destroyed by the Babylonians. And now the Jews are taken into exile. But what made these events even more bitter is that their brothers, their next door neighbors, simply watched and did nothing. Nothing to help them. Not only did they just stand aloof and watch what happened, and we know all that, all, all that, that needs to happen for, for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And so the Edomites just kind of stood, and, but, but they entered in even more. They, they began to laugh and they began to ridicule, in fact, looting. So you can see how this even ties in with, with what's been going on in our country. They, they looted their goods. They actively collaborated in helping the Babylonians destroy their brothers. So I want you to look at verses 10 to 14. Just glance there for a moment. We won't unpack this text, but I want you to see this is kind of the, the charge sheet, the list of crimes that the Edomites committed against their brother. Even though the Babylonians were doing it, they were kind of behind there cheering them on, so to speak. And look at verses 10 to 14. God says to them, because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You should not look down on your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. See, God can't stand gloating. We need to search our hearts. Sometimes we gloat over the misfortune of others. There's a sermon in there. Verse 13, you should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor look down on them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. And history tells us that it may have even been the Edomites. They were the ones that went in afterwards and ransacked the temple and even set the temple alight. We can't confirm that. Verse 14, you should not wait at the crossroads. The Edomites knew where the secret paths were and they waited at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. So what were they doing? They were, they were standing there and saying, well, let's just capture some of these guys, our brothers that are running away, and let's hand them over into slavery to Babylon. Maybe we'll even cut down and slaughter some of them. So if you just glance at verse 10 to 14, what, what happened there? The Edomites stood aloof. They rejoiced over Judah's downfall. They looted the city. And they stopped the fugitives from fleeing. God sees it all. And he calls it to account. And he calls his people not to stand aloof. And God sees what's happening even in our country. And he calls us not to stand aloof. Obadiah's prophecy against the Edomites reminds us that God is a God of justice. And justice will always come. He listens to the cry of his children who cry out to him day and night. And he will grant justice in his time. I know it doesn't look like that. If you're a Jew on your way into exile for 70 years in Babylon, uh, it certainly doesn't look like justice is coming. Certainly not towards the Babylonians and certainly not to your brothers who just rubbed salt in the wounds. Tim Shenton writes... 
in his commentary, a, a great summary, I think, of Obadiah. He says, Obadiah contains a message of hope an encouragement for every Christian. The Lord reigns forever. It does not matter how many nations oppose his rule or oppress his people. It makes no difference how many spiritual forces of evil ally themselves for his dethronement, for his purposes will prevail. All that he's promised will be fulfilled. He is in control. His dominion is an eternal dominion. In his time, he brings down the wicked. And we have to believe that. That's what Obadiah is about. So this is how I would outline the book of Obadiah. I think there's three kind of main sections. Verses one to nine is Edom's judgment is announced. So there's judgment announced. Then verses 10 to 14, the section we've read and we're not gonna look at again, is Edom's crimes are listed. So what's the cause for this judgment that's now been announced? Well, we've read that. And then verses 15 to 21, the certain promise that God's justice is coming. For God's enemies, that means judgment, and for God's children, it means restoration. So let's focus in now on verses 1 to 9. Edom's judgment is announced. In verse 1 we read, the vision of Obadiah, this is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. We've heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, rise and let us go against her for battle. And so because of what we read about in verses 10 to 14, God is about to go out in battle against the Edomites. And can I ask you, who do you think is going to win? Edom or God? God. You see, Edom has an inflated view of self. And so Obadiah launches this missile in verse 1 to to, 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 to pop their puffed up pride. He wants to bring them down from the dizzy heights where their kind of hot air balloon of self-righteousness is floating up as they look down on everyone. He wants to fire this missile and, and blast them out the sky. And this is what he says. This is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. This is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. What the sovereign Lord says about you is far more defining than what you say about yourself. That is deeply challenging. Because what God sees, what God says about you is more defining than what your peers say, what your friends think, what your family thinks, even what you may think of yourself. You could be delusional. Only what God thinks and sees is what is truly defining. And the Edomites were a proud nation who trusted in themselves. They didn't trust in God. And the irony is that the very things that Edom trusted in were the very same things that led to their downfall. So what did they take pride in? Here's a list as we read through verses two to nine. They took pride, first of all, in their self-sufficient position. That's verses two to four. They took pride in their city. They obviously consulted some good real estate agent who said location, 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 and they got the best location in the known world at the time. They lived 1,150 meters above sea level. Untouchable, invincible. I wanna show you some pictures. So look at kind of the altitude here. That's where Edom is, those high cliffs going up. Now keep in mind they're 1150 meters above sea level, but keep in mind the valley down beneath, the the, the Dead Sea is 430 meters below sea level, so that makes them even higher. And uh, you can just see kind of just some of these cities that, that are mentioned in the scriptures that were part of Edomite territory. There's Bosra. That's one of the, the, the main cities. I mean, look how invincible that looks to, to have, a, have a city up on top of that mountain. Who's going to get you there? And then Selah is another city mentioned many, many times. This is probably their capital. It's an incredible uh, just location if you want to have a political advantage. Selah in the Hebrew means rock. And so some scholars have said maybe Selah is Petra, as we've discovered it today. Petra in the Greek means rock. So we can't be too sure. Was Petra the capital of Edom? Was it just one of the other cities? We're not too sure. So take a look at these pictures of Petra. Maybe you've heard about Petra. I mean, that little gorge going in there gets so narrow. Maybe some of you have visited Jordan and, 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 and you've seen um, just this incredible discovery. And this is where the movies come in because Indiana Jones was shot there and all the other movies that I spoke about. And when you come through, you see these amazing temples that were carved into the rock. Now, they weren't carved there by the Edomites, but they were carved there by the the people that conquered the Edomites, the Nabataeans. 
But I have no doubt that there were some work already had been done by the Edomites. They probably lived there and they had built temples and things right into the rocks. It's just incredible if you were to go there. It's one of the, uh, been voted one of the wonders of the world. So that gives you a, an idea. They had an internal water supply. A river flowed through there. This is incredible. If you had water in those days, you could be self-sufficient. We think money is the currency of today. In those days, in the desert, it was water. And when the Nabataeans came and they built up Petra into what we see today, they built something like 200 kilometers of, of, of water pipelines. And it was said that, that the people inside the city of Petra, each person per day could get eight liters of fresh water. That is luxurious by any standards, maybe in, in the whole of known history. So not only were the Edomites self-sufficient, so were, were, were the Nabataeans who came in their place. The Edomites didn't need to depend on anyone else. They didn't need to look for sustenance outside of their strong resources, and certainly not from God. But look what God says to them in verse 2. See. You see, because they couldn't see it. They were deceived. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. God's saying you're going to be cut down to size because anyone who harms God's children will have to face God's justice. Look at verses three and four. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights, you who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Isn't that sobering? The deceptiveness and the delusionalness, if I can make up such a word, of pride. It's almost as though the Edomites were even taunting God. Look God, we're the king of the castle. See if you can bring us down from here. And how many in our world to taunt God? Some of the, the pages I read online from certain militant atheists, sometimes those are the exact words on their lips, asking God if he's real to strike them down. They're saying we're invincible. And that's what pride does. Pride always looks down on others and it forgets to look up and recognize, hang on a minute, there's a great big God above me, but I'm up here with my privilege and my entitlement looking down on others. We all need Christ. No good work that you have built with your own hands can ever save you from God's judgment. Nothing. You can show me all your achievements, all your accomplishments, all the heights you've gone to, all the ladders you've climbed, and not one of those achievements can save you. Not one. They're not good enough, they're not high enough to reach God's standard. We need Christ, and Christ says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But in Christ, we can do all things. Just think of eagles that soar up there and then come down and attack their prey. It was almost like they were arrogantly saying, well, we soar like eagles because that's what they'd done to their brothers. Oh, look what's happening with Babylon down in Jerusalem. And they swept down and just kind of picked up the spoils. And throughout history, evil persecutors have done that. In their arrogance and their defiance of God, they've swooped down and they've said, let me wipe the face of God from this planet. Let me rip up the Bible. Let me burn it. Let me destroy God's name and the name of Christ from the face of the earth. And we know from church history, the church has limped along often. It has been bleeding. And even right in this century, which has always been said, then more Christians have been martyred in the last century than in all the centuries before. And I think that's true as I read what's happening in our world. And so the church has always cried out, how long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? But I'm here to tell you on the authority of the word of God that Obadiah's God is not afraid of heights. Obadiah's God, <laughs> with one single bound, can make it up to the highest, most secure, seemingly invincible place. God will send Eden plummeting from the heights. In fact, God is the one who had given them this mountain. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 5, God says, I've given them this land. It was God's gift to them. And God gives all of us gifts. What do you have that you have not received? None of us are different from anyone else. Everything we have, we received as a gift from God. And so we need to remember that what God gives us, he can also take away. Pride deludes us into thinking, well, if God's given this, this is now mine and only mine, and I am entitled to this but we ought to hold everything God gives us with an open hand, lest our pride deceive us. 
One commentator says, drunk on pride and deceived by a false sense of security, Edom will tumble from its height and become an object of derision among the nations. So they took pride in their location, their self-sufficient position. What else? Look at verses five and six. They took pride in their wealth. Edom was situated on the main trade routes of the day. They kind of, uh, in some sense, set up a toll road like a sand roll. There they were, sand roll, saying, hey, let's, let's bring in the money. That's partly how they got wealthy. There's also archaeological evidence that there was copper smelting works in the area. We're not sure if it was from this time or a little bit later, but certainly a region. You even saw those red rocks. Interesting that Edom, red, and there they lived with their red rocks. Abadiah says, well, what of their wealth? Look at verse five and six. He says, if thieves came to you for robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you. You sense a compassion, a, a, a kind of a, a, can't they see this coming? He says, oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would these thieves not steal only as much as they wanted? And if grave, grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasures pillaged. Think about it. A normal thief can only steal as much as he can carry. And those of us that have had our homes broken into, we know that, that not everything is taken. The eggs aren't often taken from the fridge. No thief goes and says, oh, I, I want to take a few ice blocks as well. And, uh, you know, some old family heirloom that's absolutely hideous. No, they go for the, what's most valuable and what they can fit in the backy. And they're not going to take everything. They're not going to take your 18-seater dining room table in the back of their small bucky. They're only going to take what they can carry. But Abadiah's prophecy is, if thieves come to you for robbers, they will take everything. You will be decimated. And no grape picker going through the field can ever pick every last little grape. There will always be something left behind. But God says, your destruction will be total. You cannot hide from my omniscience. Even your most hidden treasures, those hidden recesses of your soul, I can see into that and everything will be brought into the light. My judgment will be thorough and it will be fair and it will, the punishment will, will match the crime. And Edom will be completely ransacked and pillaged because pride cannot hide you from God. So they took pride in their self-sufficient position and their wealth. What's going on in verse seven? They took pride in their allies and their connections. And God turns it all around in verse seven and he says, all your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. Edom was not only self-deceived, they were deceived by even their closest connections and allies. She didn't have a clue what was coming. As wise as she thought she was, with all the connections set up, you know, even if, if, if surrounding nations try and attack us, we've got all these other ones, we've got treaties and agreements with, and God says even that will be turned around and your pride is so blinding that your wisdom won't even see it coming because it's a false wisdom. And then fourthly, they took pride in their wisdom and strength in verses eight and nine. And God says, in that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, the men of understanding in the mountains of Esau? Your warriors, O Taman, which is another name for Edom, will be terrified and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. Even Edom's strongest and wisest men, those that they would showcase and say, these are our strongest men. Even if people can get into a secure fortress like Petra, we, we, we've got these strong guys. And, and God says, when judgment comes, even the strongest, wisest will be quaking in their boots because it's folly to be wise in your own eyes and not to fear the Lord. So what can we learn from Obadiah? Just three lessons I wanna leave you with this morning. And I trust that you'll go deeper into the book. There's so much that would have been beautiful for us to uncover, but, but I, I rather want to just give you a flavor. The first lesson is that pride comes before a fall. Pride comes before a fall. And the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church centuries later says the same. He says, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. We never want to get into a place where we think, well, now I'm standing firm and it's in my own strength and not recognizing that we only stand because of God, because like, like Peter who was self-presumptuous, what happened, he fell, he fell. And when you trust self, you climb higher and higher and higher, but the higher you climb in your pride, the further you will fall. And the pride of your heart feeds you a lie. 
But the reality is that what goes up must come down. And Obadiah wants to challenge our self-sufficiency this morning. What are you trusting? Your wealth, your position, your location, your status, your privilege, your connections, all of the things they trusted in, your wisdom, instead of trusting God. And when you think about it, pride lies at the root of every single sin. In essence, every single sin is an attempt to dethrone God and to boost myself up onto the heights so that I can be God. And yet when when I think about 23, 24 years of full-time ministry, and maybe my memory is bad, but I can't recall a single person ever coming to see me and saying, Justin, I'm really struggling with the issue of pride. Oh, the symptoms of pride. But if pride is the sin beneath the sin, shouldn't we be talking about that, searching our hearts, asking God's spirit to show us? Tim Challey is an author, says pride is a state of mind or more essentially a condition of the heart in which a person has supplanted the rule of God over his life with the rule of his own will. Instead of depending entirely on God as was God's design, a proud heart now looks to itself to decide what is good and evil. This was exactly the folly of Adam and Eve when they determined to disobey God, to become like God. So that's the challenge for us this morning. To search our hearts because pride comes before a fall. But the second lesson, I believe, from Obadiah is an encouraging one, and that is that nothing is too hard for God. Nothing. The amazing thing about God's word and this prophecy is I like to think that both the Edomites and the Israelites who heard this prophecy must have thought this is too unbelievable. Both of them. Both Edom in their arrogance and and Israel in in their pain and suffering must have said, this is impossible. Does does Obadiah, uh, is he on drugs? He just has to lift up his eyes and look. This place is invincible. It will never fall. It'll never happen. Edom's never going to become small. They're never going to become utterly despised. And the Edomites must have thought the same thing. And to that, the prophet Obadiah says, people of God, What seems humanly impossible to you is not impossible to God. Do you believe that? Enemies, dictators, the injustices that you face, maybe even the abuse. Maybe you grew up in an abusive home where you know what it's like, where a blood brother, family ties actually physically abused you. And you say, where was God? Has he even noticed that? Maybe you face the horrors of death itself and you say, death is invincible. I'm feeling the pain right now of grief and loss. But I want to say to you that what seems invincible to you is not invincible to God. What are the invincible Edoms in your life that you've just written off and you said, that person, that nation, that dictator, that country I'm praying for, it will never fall, it'll never happen. What is that Edom in your life? What is the Edom stronghold in our country that we say, I'm not sure that'll ever change? Obadiah wants to encourage God's people with a certain word that God is strong, that even invincible Edoms are no match for God. You see, because Edom stands as a picture. Edom is actually an object lesson of all nations. That's what verses 15 and 16 say. Have a look there. Edom is a picture of all people that defy God. Verse 15 says, now having spoken about Edom a whole lot, in verse 15 there's a switch and he says, the day of the Lord is near for all nations. Hang on a minute. Edom is a picture of all who defy God. And he says, as you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head, just as you drank on my holy hill. So all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. Sobering words. It appears from this text that perhaps Edom, when they'd gone into the temple, maybe they drank some of the wine, maybe right there on God's holy hill, the place that represented his, his presence in the most arrogant way, got drunk there. And God says, well, when I come in judgment, you will drink again of my wrath. But you will drink and you will drink, and like a drunkard, you will drink yourself into oblivion. I remember in 2009, standing on a stage in Caesarea Philippi, a stage that had been built by King Herod. And as I stood on that stage looking at these stones that that he had, had built and this massive theater that I looked out on, 
Just a, a few minutes away is, is Herod's harbor that he built with, with an invention of special concrete that could set underwater, the first ever invented in human history. Having just come from Mount Masada, an impenetrable fortress which has Herod's palace carved into the side through the backs of slaves and all this. And when you look at it, you think, how on earth did they even build something on top there? Because he wanted to be secure and he wanted to defy God. And there's this long line of Herod's that sought to defy God. And as I stood on that stage, I thought, what must it have been like for the people of God? To know that this was one of the most self-absorbed, despotic, evil madmen that had ever lived. And go and read some of the historical reviews, particularly from Josephus and others who were at the time. Uh, even some, some modern psychiatrists and psychologists have used Herod as an example of just all sorts of things because there's so much information on his life. And he defied God. The long line of Herods that tried to murder Christ, oppose the gospel. And as I stood on that stage, I thought, must have felt like this dictator will never ever vanish and if he goes his son will just take over and there'll be this long line that will never end and as I stood on that stage I realized Herod is no more his kingdom is no more in fact Acts chapter 12 describes just how he died on that very stage for defying God and you can go and read Josephus on the graphic details of some things that that actually took place now here's an interesting thing you may not realize that King Herod was an Idumean from a place called Idumea. And you know what that is? It's just the Roman word for Edomite. King Herod was an Edomite. He was descended from Esau. And so all these centuries later, there's still this hostility between the force of evil and the gospel in Christ and Herod's desire to stamp out the gospel. Isn't it ironic that after Herod, After that account of him dying on that platform, there is no mention as far as I can find of the Edomites in history ever again. Vanished. As a people group, they ceased to exist in complete fulfillment of this prophecy. And Obadiah says that Edom is this object lesson. And he says, as you have done, it'll be done to you. Saying what goes around comes around. Do you know that Robert Mugabe once arrogantly said that only God can remove me from office? Do you know that the atheist philosopher Nietzsche once shouted out, God is dead? John Lennon once declared, Christianity will go, it will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right and I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. And Edom said the same And every single Edomite type person who's followed in the descendancy and legacy of Edom at a spiritual level has vanished from the face of the earth. Pride comes before a fall, but nothing is too hard for God. And may our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world take hope from these truths because they're feeling the brunt of it today. They're feeling the reality of it in a way that maybe we are not. And then the third And final thing that I learned from Obadiah is that God's word is sure. God's word is 100% sure. Justice is coming. Justice is coming. Look at verses 17 to 21. But on Mount Zion, that's God's mountain, it's the place of God's presence, is where the temple was. But on Mount Zion, the very place where the temple has been destroyed, will be deliverance. It will be holy and the house of Jacob will possess its inheritance. The house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph will be a flame. The house of Esau will be stubble and they will set it on fire and consume it. There will be no survivors from the house of Esau. The Lord has spoken. And then drop down to verse 21. The in-between is just a whole lot of places and things that were going to take place that I won't go into now. Verse 21 ends. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau and the kingdom will be the Lord's. I believe Obadiah is saying a few things to us about God's sure justice. He's saying evil will certainly be punished. Those faithful to God will have a hope and a future. God is sovereign in human history, and God's ultimate purpose is to establish his kingdom. You know how unfair life is. We all do. We've all experienced life's unfairness. But the gospel says God is coming to put things right. 
And it may seem a long time coming. It may seem impossible. It may seem like the, the mountains are just too big and what's been done is just too deep. You may even feel you've been carried away to Babylon and there's no hope. And maybe you won't even see that hope in your lifetime. 70 years in, in Babylon, maybe many of those doubted God's prophecy and said, well, I don't know what Obadiah was on about. But those who malign Christ's name and persecute his children will face God and God will vindicate his children in time. And Obadiah makes a staggering claim. He says there'll be no survivors from the house of Edom. He says they'll be small, they'll be utterly despised. But on Mount Zion, there'll be deliverance for God's people. It's on Mount Zion that God will come and wipe away every tear. So can I ask you something as we bring things to a close? Can you be sure of God's word? Can you be? Could God's people at the time of Obadiah actually be sure that this prophecy would come true? And, and maybe they couldn't. Maybe they had doubts. Just like you in your era and your day have doubts about prophecies that are still to come true. Well, other Old Testament prophets joined their voices with Obadiah. And they also declared that Edom would be utterly destroyed. There are something like more than a hundred prophecies and poetry in the scriptures about Edom. Here's just three brief ones, and I could have gone into a lot of detail. Jeremiah 49. Jeremiah says, so no one will live there in Edom, no man will dwell in it. Malachi says, I have turned Esau's mountains into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. And the prophet Isaiah says, from generation to generation, Edom will lie desolate. These prophecies were unbelievable. I mean, they're as unbelievable as me saying I'm a prophet and saying, Johannesburg is going to be completely destroyed. There'll be nothing left of the city. We'll be left to wild jackals. But yet the rest of Gauteng will carry on Unharmed. You would say that is impossible because that's what Edom was. They were the Johannesburg of the day. So did God's word come true? Yes, it did. It came true 100%. And there's so many fulfillments of prophecies that I could give you. But let me give you a few highlights. Just a few hundred years after Obadiah, the Edomites were conquered by the Nabataeans who came in and sent them running. And then there were some other historical things that happened that as a nation they were already dissolving by the time of King Herod. And then after Christ, 363 AD, an earthquake destroyed the city of Petra and it lay uninhabited, crippled by the vital water management system that was now destroyed. And there were some, some people that inhabited it for a, for, for a little bit, but, but essentially its, its glory days were gone. And eventually, after another few centuries, that city lay empty lost to the world for centuries until a man by the name of John Lewis Burkhart rediscovered it in 1812. In the things that I read, even the locals refused to go near the city of Petra. So for more than 500 years, Petra lay uninhabited, unseen by outsiders, undocumented by maps. And when Burkhart published his report, and it's an interesting story of how he discovered Petra, but when he published his report, it seemed to the world unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable, that such a place could have existed only 161 kilometers away from Jerusalem without being known. And it lay ransacked, its treasures long pillaged, and the only people who visit it now are tourists, who stand back and they say, what on earth happened to this once great city? How could it be lying in ruins? Where are the princes? Where are the treasures? Where is the legacy? Where are these people? One early explorer to the area of Petra wrote, I wish that the skeptic could stand as I did amidst the ruins of the city among the rocks and there open the sacred book and read the words of the inspired penman written when this desolate place was one of the greatest cities in the world. I see the scoffer arrested, his cheek pale, his lips quivering and his heart quaking with fear as the ruined city cries out to him in a voice loud and powerful as one risen from the dead. Though he would not believe Moses and the prophets, he beholds the handwriting of God himself in the desolation and eternal ruin around him. And that early explorer wrote that just a few years after Petra was rediscovered in the 1800s. So friend, won't you leave your pride behind? Won't you turn to Christ 
Won't you leave your doubt and recognize that if God has given us hindsight to see this fulfilled, what about all the other things that we doubt he will fulfill? Come to the Christ who was forsaken and betrayed by his own brothers who went to the cross in your place. He allowed himself to endure the scoffing of Herod to endure the injustice of Pontius Pilate, see him hanging there on the cross. He surrendered his lofty place. He was truly invincible. He was truly privileged. He was truly entitled and he gave it all up to hang on a cross. There is deliverance in Mount Zion because the Lord Jesus Christ has drunk that cup of wrath. And he has drunk it to the dregs so that it made him like a, a drunken person in his stupor as he absorbed the wrath of God on our behalf. So that whoever turns to him in repentance and faith will know freedom from self. Bring your pride, bring your privilege, bring your aloofness, bring your standing back and watch, watching evil happen around you. Bring all of your sin, bring all the abuse that you have faced, maybe from family members, from people close to you, and discover grace afresh that there is one who died in your place to set you free. There's one who has living water a self-sufficient living water that can be found in him, those springs that are within you, within the city of your heart. Friends, Obadiah begins with God in verse one. He ends with God in verse 21. The kingdom will be the Lord's, only the kingdom of God will last forever. Come and find hope before it's too late and before judgment comes. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for prophets that speak. Lord, we know that we, your people, are always resistant to prophetic word that comes from the mouth of God because when it unsettles us, Lord, it, it shakes our foundations. But Lord, we belong to an unshakable kingdom because if we know you, Lord, we have a true foundation. Lord, won't you continue to shake the foundations that we have built to remind us that they are not lasting, they are man-made and they simply puff us up and enable us to have status before other people. Lord, floor us again by the fact that you have come an infinite distance when you didn't have to, to raise us up on eagle's wings to soar with you, Lord, knowing that it's only because of your grace. Lord, won't you help us in the days in which we live as we see xenophobia, as we see men attacking women, Lord, as we see brothers attacking brothers, as we see conflict and hatred and nation rising up against nation, won't you give us wisdom to know how to pray? But Lord, to know that you see all that happens and that you will bring justice in your time and, and you call us to make sure that we are ready to meet you. Lord, may we share this gospel of hope that there's nothing impossible for God and may we see the Edoms that we fear crumble because Lord, you are using us to bring a gospel of hope and a gospel of grace because you have taken the wrath upon yourself. Lord, enable us to read your word with an excitement each day as we journey with you because we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.